Hey everybody, welcome to Pop Culture Philosophers. I'm Rockin' Robbie Billups, and it's time for the weekly comic book review. That's right, everybody. Welcome to the weekly comic book review. It's the show where I read a lot of comic books, and I let you know what I thought about them. And we always start with the pick of the week, but first of all, a big announcement. We now have marked two years here at the Weekly Comic Book Review on Pop Culture Philosophers. So thank you guys so much for your support. Today, the first, so it was the first October in 2016, the pick of the week was Shade the Changing Girl, number one. It was the very first Weekly Comic Book Review I did, and I've done one every week since. So thank you guys so much for your support, for checking us out over at the PCP Army on Facebook, the Pop Culture Philosophers page, popculturephilosophers.com, and patreon.com slash PCP. Thank you guys so much. And seriously, the Patreons, they get early access, exclusive video content, things like that. People like David Hatch and Alex Inkster, they're like the coolest guys. You definitely got to get to know them over at the PCP Army because uh, they're just super, super cool. But thank you guys so much for your support of this channel. We recently crossed 3,000 subscribers. Today marks the two-year anniversary of the weekly comic book review. So, Wednesday night is going to be a special live stream during the Yankees game where we'll be doing some, uh, like a contest announcement. Maybe you want to check that one out. But let's get right on to it with the pick of the week. That's how we start. These Savage Shores, number one. This book is from Bolt Comics, and yet again, Bolt Comics knocks this one out of the park. This time, they take their stab um, at horror comics, right? Really good stuff. It's a vampire tale set in India in the 1700s. Really cool stuff. Nice commentary. Um, I would say social commentary, but it's it's kind of dated, right? But it's also still relevant today. Love this book. Has a very Bram Stoker type vibe. This book was so expertly, de deliberately crafted. This book is amazing from everybody involved. Ram V is the writer. Sumat Gamar is the illustrator. Summit Gamar is the illustrator. Vittorio Astoni is the coloring um, by him, and Aditya Bidikar does the lettering. Every single piece, every single piece from the script. The pacing, the art, the coloring, the lettering, the placement of the dialogue, the panels, lots of nine page, uh, not nine panel grids in this one to expert effect, an expertly crafted and paced comic book. This is amazing. It's a horror comic book with a little bit of bite to it, no pun intended, but it also has a lot of substance behind it as well. But it's just absolutely expertly crafted. This book is exactly how you do a comic book story, how you do an issue number one. It's got a great hook at the end. It's got a great setup, a great cast, great characters, beautiful, luscious artwork. Like I said, the nine panel grid is used to maximum effect in this comic book. Fantastic work with the art team. Fantastic job with the scripting. Look at those beautiful pages. They flow. For instance, one page in here takes the nine panel grid. And instead of just reading it like this, it makes you go like this. And it works so perfectly, expertly well. This book is definitely a highlight. Last week, you know, a couple of Vault books just completely knocked it out of the park. Vault is coming up right now as a publisher. I haven't read a single thing from them that I've disliked. These Savage Shores is no exception. Get it if you can. If your comic book shop doesn't have it, request it. Pre-order it. Get it on your want list. These Savage Shores, number one, fantastic book. Speaking of Vault, let's talk about Deep Roots, number four. Deep Roots Return. I just recently did a top five Vault comics. Deep Roots is on that list. I love this book. It's a, basically a story. It's like the movie The Happening, but really, really good. Not bad. Not the crappening, but really, really cool. It's the world of mythology, folklore, the world of, of plants and vegetation coming and intruding onto the world of man to wreak vengeance for mankind's um, negligence over the centuries, right? Really cool stuff. Beautiful artwork. That's my cover of the week. This stuff harkens back to Burning Rights and Swamp Thing type work, uh, the Stephen Bissett, um, John Tuttleman type stuff. Really highly detailed type stuff. Beautiful, luscious artwork. Crazy cool ideas and a great story that's kind of heating up, gearing up to that finale. Very excited for Deep Roots. That book's been just killing it right now. Let's move over to DC Comic Books. The Witching Hour, number one. It's the start of the Justice League Dark Wonder Woman crossover. People have really been responding well to Justice League Dark. They're crafting a really creepy, cool tale about the magic side of the DC Universe. Um, more fully integrating Wonder Woman into that world with Zatanna and Detective Chimp and even Man Bat, but of course uh, Swamp Thing as well. So this is kind of like James Tiny IV, the writer. This is his big crossover, his first big idea. They just recently, last week, introduced the Upside Down Man, one of the creepiest, like, one, like absolutely super creepy and very Clive Barkerish, but without 
the 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 Cenobite connotations that we have from like the Batman who laughs or whatever. But the Upside Down Man is super super creepy. Wonder Woman's origins are now kind of in flux. Not her origin per se, but just kind of. There's some things in the past that haven't been revealed that kind of lead into the story. Magic is coming back with a vengeance at the DC Universe and the Witching Hour. Wonder Woman, Justice League Dark, you do not want to miss this. This is essential if you read Justice League Dark. Absolutely. And I am certain those Wonder Woman crossovers are going to be essential as well. Batman the Max, Arkham Dreams, number one. When this was first announced, we were super, super excited. We love the Max. We love what Sam Keith does. This Batman Max, Arkham Dreams, it's all right. It's pretty cool. Seriously, the artwork is luscious. It's gorgeous. It's Sam Keith doing what Sam Keith does. And Batman's involved as well. So if you are a super hardcore Max fan, I would definitely recommend that you check this out. If you're a super hardcore fan of brilliant innovative comic book work there you go but if you're just a fan of story you're going to find it to be rather confusing a little out there um a little nonsensical at times but i found it to be a fun throwback to the max and the days of like sam keith is just such a brilliant artist um but the story's a little it's a little hard to follow especially if you're not a, a max fan from back in the day but i thought it was all right so max fans you're definitely going to like this sam keith fans you're going to love it for sure justice league number nine is here um, everybody's talking about Justice League Dark. I'm like Justice League. This is one of my favorite superhero books on the shelves right now. Scott Snyder's just hitting every single ball out of the park. So excited every time a new issue comes out, which is usually every couple weeks. Great stuff. This one has great artwork by Jorge Jimenez. It's kind of, it's got a little bit of a, it's, some people are saying this is a tie-in, like the first Drowned Earth prelude. Not really, but there is a scene with Aquaman and Wonder Woman, which is expertly done, by the way, by Scott Snyder. His characterizations. So the first few issues of this have been this big, epic struggle of, of the Justice League reforming, coming up against Lex Luthor with this new motivation in the universe and his world. And he's formed the new Legion of Doom. And everything's been crazy and balls to the wall. And even the moon got destroyed just like very insignificantly. And they... They briefly mentioned it, but this is a slow down type issue. Really cool stuff that really focuses in on some character dynamics. Batman and Superman, Wonder Woman and, and Aquaman, Hot Girl and Martian Manhunter, Flash and Green Lantern. Really some nice, it's a nice slow down issue right before things start heating up again. We know that Black Mana and Cheetah are setting up, getting ready for the next unknown forces of the multiverse to come forth. Um, I'm loving this book so much. The stakes have never been higher. This is a nice, like, chill down, settle down, simmer down type tone. Um, really fun stuff, though, with still a lot of action and beautiful artwork by, artwork by Jorge Jimenez. And they do straight up address the idea that the moon got destroyed. So, really cool stuff. I'm loving what Snyder and company are doing on the Just League books. Absolutely. Batman number 56 is here in the first issue where I get to spotlight these new foil covers from DC this month. So be on the lookout for this. This month, uh, this today, we got five, I think, unexpected Curse of Brimstone, Green Lanterns, Green Arrow, and Batman. Maybe there's another one that I missed, but I don't know. They're really, really nifty. They're super, super sharp. They're very clean. Um, they're in great condition, the ones that we got. Um, it's just a really fun package. Absolutely, these foil covers are cool. Let's talk about Batman number 56, though, because in issue number 55, some major stuff happened at the end of it involving Dick Grayson, Nightwing, and so that's kind of interesting, and I don't know if I should really spoil that right now, but this deals with the ramifications. Batman's after the guy who did it. It's KG Beast, and we already know that from the solicitations, and it's just a really cool, chilling story as far as that part goes. The Batman part's pretty good, too. Tony Daniels' artwork... It feels a little rushed. It does. It does. But the story's really good. Tom King has been killing it on this book since the wedding issue. Since issue number 50, every issue's just been splendid and fantastic and some of the best yet in Tom King's Batman run, in my opinion. This issue is no exception. I love what's going on here with KG Beast. It's the, really the, it's the most interesting the villain has ever been to me. It's in the pages right here of Tom King's Batman. Number 56 with artwork by Tony Daniel. That really nifty foil cover. So Nightwing number 50 is here. I don't typically read this book. Benjamin Percy's last issue. I believe that he's leaving the book because of editorial direction and what's going on as a result of what's going on in Batman right now. Um, Nightwing is different. I'm not going to try to spoil it, but I will say this. I didn't really like the book because it seems like what they're trying to do right now is bring more of an edge to Nightwing, to Dick Grayson. Richard Grayson doesn't need that kind of edge. I don't think so. Maybe they're doing it to make it more in line with the Titans because it seems like they're going to give a more gritty, angry approach to Grayson in that book. Um, but this, it takes the character of Grayson and it, it just, it completely redoes something. It just does it, it take a complete 180. It's more like Jason Todd. This would be 
a very cool characterization for someone like a Jason Todd type character, but not for Dick Grayson. It's not working for me. The explanation is kind of thin. It kind of came out of nowhere. I just don't know whose idea that was. I have a sinking suspicion it was all editorial. Adventures of the Super Sons number three is here. This book has been super fun. Super Sons has been great since it started. Peter Tomasi really nails the character of Jonathan Kent and Damian Wayne. A very fun adventure with a kid injustice gang. Really fun stuff. Good artwork by, uh, is it Barberi? Car uh, yeah, Carlo Barberi. Really fun stuff. Dynamic. Fluid, great action-oriented story that's really, really fun and just great and chock full of those characters. And seriously, Tomasi, nobody writes, nobody writes uh, those characters together like Tomasi. Nobody else has touched it. Green Arrow number 45 is here, one I typically don't read. That's a great cover, almost pick of the week. Is that Alex Maleev? I think it is. A beautiful foil cover, once again. But this Green Arrow issue I read because it directly follows some of the events that happened last week in Heroes in Crisis. And I'm not going to spoil that right here. We've already spoiled that on the live stream this last Sunday. Um, but this directly deals with those ramifications. And it's an alright issue. Um, if you know what I'm talking about, um, and it's a Green Arrow book, and if you like that character, and, and, and it's, it's just if you read Heroes in Crisis and you're affected emotionally, maybe you want to check this out. It's also a really good tie-in, and it is a tie-in. Though it doesn't say so. Maybe some people won't pick it up because they don't realize that. Green Arrow is kind of an underordered book. So maybe if Heroes in Crisis takes off, this might be one of those books you might want to get right now. Especially because of the foil cover, which is seriously one of the most badass ones of the week. Curse of Brimstone number 7 has a foil cover as well. I don't read Green Lanterns. That one had a really, really good one. And I don't read The Unexpected right now. But Curse of Brimstone, I read this one. I think I may have skipped an issue. I don't know. The artwork's decent, but the story's really thin now. Um, what was really interesting to me about this story is just kind of... Well, that was the idea. There was just the idea of what this book would be, and then I don't feel like the follow-through has, has been very, very good, or at least deserving of more than six issues to wrap everything up. I don't know. Still not really... I'm still kind of a fan of it. I really like the early issues, but I'm starting to... My interest is definitely starting to wane, but that is a cool foil cover. Absolutely. Over at Vertigo, we got Sandman Universe The Dreaming. Um, this issue is kind of boring. Like, it's all right. The artwork is amazing. I really do like the artwork. Really great stuff. It's right in the vein of what Neil Gaiman and his artists were doing over at Sandman. So it's got really cool stuff, interesting story techniques and narrative ideas. Um, but ultimately, I just find this boring. And, you know, Mervyn's one of my absolute favorite characters from the Sandman universe. And I just, I don't know, man. This To do a whole story and it's just boring. I don't know. I really like the artwork. I don't think the story is bad. I just feel like it's a little boring. It's a little plotting. It's a little more like it's trying to imitate a Neil Gaiman book instead of just giving us a really cool exceptional story. That's just how I'm feeling right now. Maybe it's something I need to go back and, and, and read a little bit more deeper into. But The Dreaming Number 2 is here this week. And look at that Jay Lee cover. That's amazing. My Vertigo pick, though, this week is Border Town number two. Issue one was the pick of the week. It was a great book. Fantastic stuff. Issue two is no exception. It does slow down the pace a little bit. Not as a little bit of characterization, a little bit of story movement. Basically, this this issue just feels like a, an in-between issue, but it was still very, very exciting with amazing artwork, a really cool script. This is a great idea. It's basically about this border town between the Mexico and the United States and all these, you know, like, like, like monster creatures from Mexican folklore get unleashed on this border town in Arizona. And <clears throat> it's really fun. These little chupacabra dudes are like super, super cute. And that's awesome. The coloring is amazing. That's Tamara Bonvillain. Um, the artwork is Ramon uh, Villalobos. And the uh, writing is done by Eric M. Esquivel. Um, fantastic stuff. They did a great job with issue number one. Issue two kept that momentum going. Um, and I'm really, really excited to see what's going to happen. From Marvel Comics, we got Shatterstar number one. I believe this is his first solo outing. Um, never really been that big of a Shatterstar fan. I thought he had a really goofy costume you know, back in the day, but I thought his action figures were cool, to be honest, especially that second one they did. You know, I don't have that one yet. I need to get a P.O. box, so if you guys can ever find any of these things, maybe you can hook me up. But uh, Shatterstar, decent. It's all right. It's written by Tim Seeley. It's got really good artwork by Carlos Dia and uh, Juan Velasco and... Uh, Gerardo Sandoval does some stuff, but Carlos Lopez's colors are really good, too. Um, it's interesting. Um, there's going to be something there for old-school X-Force fans. If you like the Nicieza stuff especially, you're going you're gonna to pick up on some Easter eggs here. There's going to be some, some other tidbits that are just kind of thrown around from X-Force and Shatterstar history. But ultimately, the characters never really appealed to me that much, but this one's kind of an interesting concept. He owns a building. He's a landlord. And he rents out his, his apartments in this building to people who are like him. They're displaced in time and reality 
in the 616 Marvel Universe. And so that's kind of an interesting idea. Um, it throws back a lot to some old school uh, Shatterstar, Mojoverse, X or X Force type stuff. Um, so those kind of fans, you're really going to like it. But ultimately, I mean, it's all right, but I do think it's kind of skippable if you're not super hardcore of a fan. X-Men Black number one is here. Magneto, the one-shot. A bunch of villain-centric one-shots coming out with an apocalypse story that's going to thread on through by Zach uh, Thompson and uh, somebody Nadler. What's the Nadler? Oh, man, what is it? Lonnie Nadler. That's right there. They're the writing team. But Chris Claremont does the, um, the the main story here. So it's a nice, focused Magneto story that's kind of interesting, and it kind of sets up where he is in the universe. And this new direction, it just seems like this is going to be a spotlight on the villains. Like, it's not going to really have that much repercussions, but it almost feels like they're setting some things back up to the way that X-Men are supposed to be. They bring up the mutant... Um, registration act again here, Magneto's motives, things like that. But it's a decent little one-and-done story involving Magneto written by Chris Claremont. And the, the, the Apocalypse story in the back um, by Nadler and Thompson um, was pretty interesting. I do like Apocalypse. I, I like a good Apocalypse story, so we'll see what happens there. The Superior Octopus, the one-shot, is here. <clears throat> Written by Christos Gage. He's doing Spider-Geddon, so this is kind of like a tie-in to Spider-Geddon. Um, very cool, interesting stuff. If you're a fan of Superior Spider-Man, Spider-Verse, things like that, you're definitely going to check this out. Is, I, is it super essential for Spider-Geddon? I would say so because of some of the stuff that happens in the backup story. Um, but seriously, I love I love Dr. Octopus. I love, Ever since Superior Spider-Man, he's been one of my favorite characters. Octavius is great. I love him as this character. This is kind of him. The bridge from, from Hydra superior octopus into spider again superior spider-man returning so it's kind of like the bridge there it's essential if you're following that story infinity wars has a tie-in and the best tie-in they've had yet it's sleepwalker number one sleepwalker is back it's written by chad bowers and chris sims they're the cast that did the the infinity countdown dark hawk revival and they totally took a very under appreciated and underutilized 90s character that was really hot for just a moment and and made them relevant again, and made it fresh again, and made it fun again. And that's exactly what they did here, again, with Sleepwalker. This was super, super fun. To add a little bit of 90s flair, Todd Nyok does the uh, art there with uh, Rachel Rosenberg doing the coloring. This is really, really fun. If you're a, a Sleepwalker fan, you're definitely going to like it. Lots of throwbacks to the old school stuff. It's a little tied into Infinity Warps, just a little loosely, I would say. But this is definitely fun. Because, I, you know, those Sleepwalker comics were awesome, right? Speaking of crazy cool comics that we remember from back in the day that are not really around that much anymore, What If, What If is back, and two issues are out this week. What If Flash Thompson became Spider-Man. This is really cool because Jerry Conway does the script. Um, old school Spider-Man uh, uh, writer. He's the guy that introduced the Punisher, killed off Gwen Stacy and Norman Osborn. This is a really fun story. What If Flash Thompson the Bully became Spider-Man instead of Peter Parker? And it's set up and structured and, and, and it's formatted much like old school what ifs were. So it even has the unseen in there instead of the watcher kind of narrating it through. It gets really, really dark all of a sudden and out of nowhere. And I remember just loving what if comic books. And we're going to be covering some of these up um, coming, uh, coming up on Comics Revisited. Um, but they would just come, they just get super dark out of nowhere, right? Like if, if one thing was different, the world's ruined, right? And this one does that. It's got a really cool one. Um, out of the two what-ifs, I think this is the strongest one this week. Flash Thompson, what if he became Spider-Man? The other one is what if the X-Men became the X-Men, the E-X-E dot men, right? So it's like a cyberpunk, cyberspace kind of version of the X-Men, right? So like humanity has now does most of their business and transactions and just daily social life um, in cyberspace, right? And cyberspace is regulated, and some people have developed a gene where when they go into cyberspace, they can, like, make weapons and, and go into private spaces and, and just change things around, like the Matrix, right? And they're the X-Men, right? So it's kind of like the, uh, retelling the X-Men like that, but it is a little just... It's a little fast, a little brisk. It kind of happens, and it's kind of gone. It seems like this would be a really, really cool concept. It gets a little dark, but not as dark as the other one did. Um, this one was an all-right story written by Brian Hill, um, but I really did like this one. A little bit better, but those are just so fun to have what-ifs back in uh, on the shelves, isn't it true? Cosmic Ghost Rider number four is here from Donny Cates. Got a couple Donny Cates books from Marvel this week. Cosmic Ghost Rider number four is the penultimate issue. This issue was great. The best issue of this title yet. It's been super fun, right? Donny Cates has not let us down with an issue of Cosmic Ghost Rider as, fun, as far as funness and zaniness and wildness goes, but he really brings some substance to this issue, seriously exploring the character of Frank Castle. Um, and putting him in a position 
in this in this just this 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 struggle of conscience and and just thought and reflection that is some of the best character work on Frank Castle ever done in a silly book like Cosmic Ghost Rider and it's great because you totally meet Thanos Punisher here. <clears throat> Can Thanos Punisher get a five-issue miniseries next? Speaking of five-issue miniseries, Don Cates and Penultimate Issues, Death of the Inhumans, number four, is here. Um, a little turn in the story, pretty interesting. Maybe things still don't seem as dour. No, nah, things are still super, super dour in this book. It's a very depressing book to read, especially for fans of the Inhumans. I think the art's a little stale, a little stagnant, but I do like the script. I do like the story. Beta Ray Bill has returned, so fans of Beta Ray Bill definitely want to pick that up. Um, Death of the Inhumans has been interesting, but there is maybe a glimmer of hope somewhere somewhere in these pages but there's also just a lot of of despair for us inhumans fans but still a fun read absolutely tony stark iron man number four is here um after like a month-long delay but it's finally here this issue it's all right dan slot valerio skitty they've been doing a great job on this title so far bringing a classic old school iron man feel back to the book at least in my opinion this one it has some nice ties to some old school wasp and tony types things from the, the from the Avengers, but ultimately this was an all right little one and done story, but not of too much significance. It was decent, it was okay, but I thought I found it overall just a little silly, maybe just a little too silly. I don't know, that's just me. Doctor Strange number six is here. I'm loving what Mark Wade and Jesus Sayas have been doing on Doctor Strange, and the end of the last issue was very very exciting, and I feel like they just kind of missed the mark on this issue. Like they didn't really kind of follow it up quite the way I was anticipating. It relies. It seems like on some knowledge of some previous Doctor Strange stories that we may not remember, including me, because I didn't read the majority of Doctor Strange stuff before, you know, I mean, before, like, I guess, J Jason Aaron, if you really think of it. Well, I read the Tony Harris and the Brian K. Bond stuff and the J. Michael Straczynski stuff. I'm getting distracted. But this issue, it was all right. Doctor Strange returns to Earth. He's no longer in space. There's two Doctor Stranges. What? I just don't feel like they really, the, the resolution of that cliffhanger from the last issue didn't have as much oomph for me as I wanted it to have. Speaking of not having as much oomph as the last issue, as Guardians of the Galaxy number two, I don't know. I really thought issue one was a very decent surprise. I actually enjoyed it. This one, I didn't really like it that much. It felt a little muddy, a little just conflicting, a little disjointed. That was just me though. As Guardians of the Galaxy, I may be passing up on that one right now. We got a couple new ones from Image. Let's talk about them. Blackbird number one. This book is written by Sam Humphreys with artwork by Jim Bartell. Jim Bartell's artwork is beautiful. It's glorious. It's amazing. Luscious colors. Fantastic stuff. Always been a fan of her artwork. The story is a little... It's a little... I think it's a little rough at first. At first, I think the story's a little hard to get into. It's a little clunky, maybe, with some of its narrative, with some of its narration. Maybe. Maybe. That's just me, right? It came across that way with me. The art was pretty to look at, though. Very simple lines, luscious colors. That's what Bartell does. But what Humphreys does in about, like the five to six or seven page count is he really starts crafting this very, very genuinely interesting story about magic and depression and, and real life and, and trying to escape reality through through a fantasy that may even be real. I don't know, but I, ultimately I really did like Blackbird. I thought it was really, really solid. I think a lot of people are definitely going to pick this, uh, be picking this one up. Image is putting a lot behind this one. The artwork is beautiful. It is glorious. Clean line work, like I said, luscious, lavish colors, great stuff, great characters, an interesting story, interesting concept. I like it. You should check it out. The other one you should definitely check out is Dead Rabbit number one. This one kind of blew me away. It's definitely fun. John McRae of Hitman fame and Gary Duggan did this one with Matt, uh, Matt Spicer. Really fun stuff. I really liked it. It's about this dude who back in the 90s was this super criminal. Not really a super criminal, but he was like this crazy, awesome criminal. Never got caught. Pulled off all kinds of heists. Pulled off a big heist. Retired. And now his wife's dying. She's sick. Things he's, He can't afford the mortgage. He's got to get a job at Walmart. Maybe it's time for him to go back to the glory days and try to pull off some heists. And it's kind of like that, that old school guy coming out of retirement and it doesn't go quite as well as he planned, but it also has a lot of nuance and a lot of heart to it. Really was very impressed with Dead Rabbit number one. Definitely should think you should check that out. Another one I think you should check out is Rainbow Bright number one. I posted up in the PCP Army Pick of the Week alert <clears throat> and I was just joking. This book was awesome. Jeremy Whitley is the writer. The artwork is done by Brittany Williams. The coloring is done by uh, Valentina Pinto and Taylor Esposito doing the lettering. <clears throat> Amazing work from all involved. This is a really cool, grounded retail retelling of Rainbow Bright, I guess. I don't know. I never read or I didn't know anything about Rainbow Bright back in the day except for the toy line. I just passed. I knew it in passing. 
Never really into Rainbow Bright. It's more of a Jim and the Holograms and She-Ra type guy, if you know what I'm saying. Um, but Rainbow Bright, this issue was really, really fun. Really cool. Great. Appropriate for all ages. I definitely would recommend if your kids are with you at the shop, they want something to read, pick this up hand it to them and then after they're done you might want to pick it up and read it yourself because it was really really fun and very intriguing and I don't know I just I was kind of sold on it man it's just the start of the story but the characters the way it was told it's just very approachable it's very inclusive really 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 fun book Rainbow Bright number one a bright of light in a, in a dark world death orb number one is here from dark horse comics i read this one and it's all right it's got an interesting premise it's got luscious beautiful coloring by chris o'halloran really got to spotlight the coloring because chris o'halloran has become one of my favorite colorists in the business right now and it seems like when you read his books like ice cream man and some other works from him you kind of define a style and you kind of okay i get what you do but then you read something like death orb and you're like no this dude can do anything with the coloring man it's fantastic it doesn't have to look the same um he's not trapped by his own style this is really really good stuff coloring wise story wise though it didn't grab me it felt very disjointed very clunky i just could not get into death orb aside from that umbrella academy number one is here volume three hotel oblivion um i didn't read this one because i haven't read book two still so I just wanted to let you guys know that it was out, and here it is by Gerard Way. From Aftershock Comics, we got Lollipop Kids number one. This one was really, really rough for the entire first half of this book. It was just so much exposition, so many words, hard to get through, and then at the end, it came across with a really, really cool concept. But man, you can't, you can't do over half of your book nothing but verbose exposition. You can't do that. You can't do that, because now you got a really cool premise, and I want to give you a shot on issue two, but it was a chore to get through that book. That's what I think about that. Sparrowhawk number one is out from Boom Studios. This one was confusing to me as well. It had really cool artwork by Mattias Basla. I really liked it, but I didn't, I don't know. I just couldn't really get into the story. It's a neat concept. Uh, evil mirror universe. Someone reaches through and pulls the person through and changes places with them. Something like that. Um, I like the artwork, but ultimately just nothing grabbed me about it. It didn't have a narrative flow that really appealed to me or just or just hung on to me, right? Star Wars Adventures Tales from Vader Castle. It is October, so it's time for some spooky Halloween-y type stuff. Tales from Vader Castle is supposed to be like uh, Star Wars Adventures, which is like all ages, you know, Star Wars tales from IDW. Um, this is kind of like their more Halloween-y, spooky type tales. So this is a story, and it's got this whole framework, apparently. It's going to go through each issue. They're going to be telling different stories throughout Star Wars lore, and they're going to be kind of vibed a little bit with a ghost story, it seems. Maybe they'll be connected in some kind of way. This one's based somewhere in the world of Rebels, because Kanan's there. I recognize that guy, the last Padawan. Um, but it was all right, but the best part about this was the cover. But the issue was all right, and it was interesting, but it didn't quite get... Halloween-y enough for me. Absolutely. And finally, let's talk about Paper Girls number 25. It's always a great new comic book day when Paper Girls is here. Brian K. Vaughn, Matt Wilson, Cliff Chang, they've been killing it with this book. Everything is very almost abundantly clear about what the story's about and how the characters are going, but they still find ways to throw wrenches into it and just make you not know what's going to come up or what to expect. A fantastic job from the entire creative team. Issue 25 is no exception. Great characterization, great artwork, great story moments. Just absolute fantastic stuff. Beautiful, luscious colors. Great covers. Great, crazy, cool, high-concept time travel type story involving a group of four paper girls from the 80s. And it's amazing. That's what I read this week, guys. What'd you read? Let me know in the comments down below. What'd you think about it? What are you looking forward to? Please talk to me. We thank you so much for checking out the video. Please do be sure to check out the channel on Thursday for the second episode of Comics Revisited. We're getting ready for this Venom movie. We're going through some old school 90s Venom books. Me and Brooks revisit Venom Funeral Pyre. That's debuting on Thursday. Patreons, Patreon supporters, you have access actually right now. Thank you guys so much for watching the video. Thank you for your support. Please do like, share, and subscribe. And let me know, like I said in the comments, what'd you read? What are you excited about? What do you love? What's going on in comics that you're just absolutely digging right now? For me this week, it's These Savage Shores. Some great books. Fantastic stuff. So thank you guys so much for rocking with us. Check us out at popculturephilosophers.com for podcasts and a whole lot more. I'm Rockin' Robbie Billups. You dig? Keep reading.